So today I'm gonna walk you through some of my favorite comic making supplies. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna do them by stages. At what stage I use each supply. I'm gonna show you guys examples. I'm gonna do a little bit of demonstrating. So if you're interested in comics, but you're a little bit daunted by the materials, you're not really sure where to start, this is a great video for you. So please keep watching. We're gonna start with some of my favorite sketching materials, fall into a few different categories. First of all, we have colored lead pencils, and these are in Color Eno mechanical pencils. They're some of my favorite mechanical pencils. They're very inexpensive. They're made in Japan. They're available in a lot of colors, and they're just perfect to hold the Color Eno color leads that I really enjoy so much. And I really enjoy these colored leads for a lot of reasons. First of all, I can use them on under drawings on color illustrations. You can just faintly see here the pink lead that I use or here where it's in its full glory, pink lead. I also use orange. No, there's pink right there, but have one with orange. Here's one with red. Pink was sort of my favorite color for this this summer. Oh no, I thought I used orange, but instead I used pink. But um, I really like these colored leads because when you put alcohol markers over them or when you watercolor over them, the color kind of disappears. This was penciled with green and blue lead and it basically disappeared, but you can see just enough of it that it really reads as like cool foliage. Not only though do I use those as underdrawing for color pieces, but I use them in the sketching stages of my comic, Seven Inch Kara. So for thumbnails and for roughs. And I can actually show you that right here. So it used to be with non-photo blue lead and they were available in color pen. They still are available in color pencils. I just happen to prefer them as leads for mechanical pencils. You can also get them as leads for big um, lead holders. But it used to be a long time ago when you would photograph or scan or film these sort of illustrations, the camera equipment was not sensitive enough to capture this very light blue. So it would leave only the inks or only the graphite. These days, cameras are sensitive enough to capture that. However, it's very, very easy to drop that in Photoshop. And I will link a tutorial on how to drop your blue lines right here so you guys can check that out. It's a fairly simple process where you're really just bumping up your contrast. So you're making your darks darker anyway. And as part of my comic making process, that's an important part. So it's just a normal part of my process. So colored leads for sketching and underdrawing. Same goes for the ruler often used for sketching, for doing straight lines. This is a clear acrylic ruler that I ordered from or I bought from Muji in San Jose. Um, I really like clear acrylic rulers. Um, you can often find these in the sewing section rather than in um, the craft section. I also have <clears throat> Sorry about that. I also have a really large Aluma cutter ruler. This used to be my go-to. It's a nice hefty acrylic um, aluminum ruler with a foam backing, but this is a little bit harder to line up as a straight edge than the clear acrylic ruler. So I like going with the acry clear acrylic ruler as well. You can also use really cheap rulers from Dollar Tree. That's what this is right here and it's still clear it still serves its purpose so if you don't feel like investing in a nicer acrylic ruler if you don't think you're going to need it and this one actually has a nice metal embedded edge this is used for inking if you don't feel like investing in that this can be a good sort of beginner's option I also have a variety of templates compasses those sort of things french curves designed for getting really nice curved lines. And to be honest, I pretty much never use them. I can pull them out for you guys. This is actually a really cool compass. And I think I got it from 
it's a Japanese compass, compass, so I think I got it from Mido. The way this works is you use either a push pin or two pencils, and you hold it down in place with one, and then you draw your circle as you go around with the other. And what's handy about this is it's just incredibly compact, and it can also double as a plain ruler. And since it is Japanese, it's on the metric system. It also functions as a compass. As you can see, it has the different degree marks to measure angles. I also have a map head or a mate, a mapped compass set that I've used, I think once, and then it broke. So I can't recommend this. As well as French curves that I've just, I, I've used these like one time when I was taking a comic drawing class at SCAD and I've never used it since. For some reason, my SCAD professors were really keen on talking us into buying templates that we weren't really gonna use. Another sketching tool I really enjoy is just a plain color pencil. This is a Prismacolor pencil. My favorite color for this is terracotta. And it's because you can get really nice faux sanguine sketches. And I have here my character design slash costume design sketchbook from chapter eight. And these were all done with color pencil. For some reason, that larger lead, that softer lead that you get with a color pencil, it just helps me think a little bit better. I used to use black for all these kind of sketches, but that can that builds up really quick. That gets really dark quick. I found terracotta to be a better solution. It's also nice for sketching humans because it's got kind of that warm color to it, that warm feeling to it. So it just looks a little bit more like traditional figure drawing sketches. From there, I have some pencils and erasers. And this isn't even all inclusive of my erasers. I tend to have like a million erasers floating around, but these are some of my favorites. This is a Creative Mark White Stroke. You can get these through Jerry's Artorama. They're very soft vinyl erasers and they're much less likely to smear your graphite, which is really important because when you're using these sort of colored leads, smearing is a lot more prone to happen. For a while, I was using a Seed Radar Knock eraser, but I've switched back over to a Tombow Mono Eraser. I love mono erasers. They come in various sizes. This is kind of the, the more um, I don't want to say standard because the, the little rectangular ones have become quite popular. Let me see, in fact, if I have one in my pencil case, which I should show you guys anyway because pencil case is part of my toolkit. And sometimes this thing is crammed so fat I can barely zip it, but it's everything I bring with me when I'm going out to sketch. So, you know, replacement leads, colored leads, Signo for white corrections, inking stuff, and I kind of gutted this for this tutorial, so not even everything that is normally in there is in there. But this is one of the smaller mono erasers, and when it doesn't have this weird little hangy bit of eraser on it, it's just a little tiny circle. In fact, you could probably tell better if I depress it like that. And I think it's the 2.3 milliliter, millimeter eraser. So this is great for really, really tiny areas. And this is one of the bigger ones. It's, I've been using this a lot this Inktober to help erase some of the blue lines from faces. Then this is just a Pentel Click Erase. These are amazing. Um, and you can get these at Walmart. I also like the Pentel um, high polymer erasers if you can't get the white stroke erasers. And the high polymer erasers are a little easier to come by. And then we have just a couple pencils. Now, this thing might look super impressive. I've had this thing for over 10 years. It is a Pentel Graph Gear 1000. It's an all metal drafting pencil. And when I bought it, this is more what it looked like in 0.7 lead. I'm heavy handed, so all my leads are 0.7. Um, when you press the clip, it retracts the lead and the sleeve. It's a sturdily built pencil, however, because it's all metal and I bear down, it was destroying my hands. Plastic pencils actually have some give. So I have B lead in this and I do use it for kind of tightening up my thumbnails on top of the non-photo blue lead. 
This has HB lead in it, and I use this for when I'm penciling my almost finished watercolor comic pages. So this is the final stage. The, the harder lead in this is less prone to migrating when I do a watercolor wash on top of it. These softer leads are more prone to smearing. So they're good for like getting a nice dark graphite line that my scanner can easily pick up. And I can easily drop the blue lines from there because it's really close to black, but it's not great for watercolor. So I have two pencils that I frequently use. And that's kind of just an overview of my basic sketching materials. Again, I'll pull out apologize that this is a little bit of a mess. I had it out when I was teaching my making comics and zines class last night. So I use the non-photo blue, the color, you know, soft blue, both for my thumbnails and for my roughs. It's nice because I can do underdrawings like you see here with these perspective grids. And that's again, when the clear acrylic ruler becomes my best buddy. And then I use um, just a little bit of washi tape to tape down additional pages so I can get it big enough. Now, for anyone who does these stages on a computer, you, this information might be nice to know, but it's not really necessary for you to make comics the way that you make comics. But I think it's always good to understand comic history, where different techniques came from, and how other artists handle their art. And I believe in here, I have, I hope I have, no, I don't have any examples, but, so these would be printed blue lines. I printed them using a dye-based uh, desktop printer. The, the dye-based ink is water soluble. So I will pencil it with my HB lead to get the outlines. Then I'll stretch it. Then I'll apply a wash of water, which dissolves all of this. And it just leaves the pencil lines visible on the page. So it's a little bit of watercolor magic. And I have some tutorials where I demonstrate that technique that you can check out by clicking here. So not shown, but incredibly important are my digital assets. I have a Surface Pro 3. I do a lot of digital drawing on that. It has Photoshop on it and Clip Studio Paint. I use Clip Studio Paint to ink and I use Photoshop for pretty much all of my other sort of editing. I use uh, Photoshop for lettering. I use Photoshop for resizing and cropping. I use it for color correction. I use it for sketching. I use it for doing digital corrections on my watercolor pages using scanned assets. Um, you can use Clip for a lot of that. You can also use free programs like Metabang Paint. Um, I'm just really familiar with Photoshop. That's what I'm comfortable with. And that's what I learned how to use when I was an undergrad. So that's kind of what I've stuck with all of these years. Um, so I have a large format Epson scanner, but when I was getting started, I had a Canon photo scanner, which was um, sort of designed to scan slides. And I can link that in the description below so you can check them out. They're sub 100, maybe 120, depending on where you get it. They're great scanners with good color accuracy. So if you wanna work in traditional media like markers or watercolor, I would really recommend that scanner. And it really didn't need a lot of color correction the problem was it's an eight and a half by 11 scanner. If you're working at larger sizes, the way many traditional comic artists do, you're going to have to scan it in pieces. And it's not always the um, auto merge, the photo merge option under automate in Photoshop is not always good at merging like whole illustrations. I'll grab an example. So it's actually pretty good at merging comic pages, but an illustration like this, I apologize, it would have a lot of trouble stitching this together and I'm not really sure why. So I ended up investing in a large, very expensive Epson large format scanner. Um, it's not as good, it's not as accurate color wise, but it's big and the time I would spend, sometimes hours spent stitching a single image together in Photoshop, um, I, it only takes me like five to 10 minutes to do some color correction. So I think the large format scanner was a good investment, certainly since I paint hundreds of watercolor comic pages. I also use a Canon PIXMA Pro 9000 Mark II as my primary printer when it comes to printing comics. I use that for printing blue lines. It is a dye-based printer and I can link that in the description below. And that's really important for a couple of reasons. So I always print kind of a blue line ghost version 
which I don't know if that will be visible on here when I do my rough. So what I do is I scan my thumbnails, I bring them into Photoshop, I make some corrections, I change the contrast, I bump them up to six by nine, which is your standard sort of roughs size. And then I print blue lines of these onto just inexpensive copier paper. And then I do my sketching and I do my hashing and I do my perspective and I do my anatomy and then I pencil over it. And the reason I like working in this stage is often I can capture composition and flow better at a small scale. And then I have trouble recreating it without some sort of sketch underneath as a basis. So having this as part of my process has really helped me out a lot. It saves me a lot of time. It saves me a lot of hair pulling. Then I'll scan this, bump up the contrast, drop the blue lines, um, convert it to grayscale, convert that to blue lines, and then I print that onto watercolor paper. And I'll go grab an example for you guys. So these are pages from chapter eight, and they've been penciled using the HB pencil I showed you guys. And that's just an inexpensive Pentel IC. I was looking for something that wouldn't wreck my hands. I can also recommend um, Sakura Sumos. Those are also really good for like those of us with arthritis or, or who have started damaging our hands. So as you guys can hopefully see, there are blue lines printed on here and then I penciled on top of it. And that's kind of like my inking stage for this, for this particular comic. With various comics, I will do various stages, stages of finish, and I'll show you guys that in a moment. I'm gonna go grab one of my in-progress watercolor pages just so you guys can see how the blue lines have dropped. So this is a stretched watercolor seven inch Kara page and I've already um, removed the blue lines so you guys can see it's mostly pencil. I've also started toning the page and since it's a dark scene, I've started under glazing with darker shadows. Um, and I have tutorials for I think all of this either here on this channel or over on my blog. I will link as many of those as possible for those of you who are interested in watercolor comics. But this is just one method of reaching a level of finish with your comics. So I just wanted to demonstrate that the non-photo blue has basically washed away. And I have here some finished watercolor. Well, I say finished. They're, I finished the watercoloring stage, but these pages aren't actually entirely complete. You can see no blue lines though, and they've been removed from their boards. I would then scan these pages, take them into Photoshop, color correct them, and begin my lettering process. And I have tutorials on digital lettering for you guys that you can check out. But this is, again, just one of many methods. So it's kind of a nice little introduction over into various ways of finishing your comic. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the materials for that. Our next step is our kind of our final paper, our nicer paper. This is where we bring out our investment papers. For all the prior stages, I recommend using cheap papers because that's not the final stage. But at this stage, it's time to work on your final paper. Now, if I'm doing standalone watercolor illustrations, I like using nicer papers like Arches or Cansa Moulin de Roy. For seven inch Kara, I'm painting hundreds of comic pages and I've gotten really used to using Canson Montval, which is a cellulose watercolor paper. It's all right, it's not the best, but it comes in the right format, it comes in the right layout, it's fairly affordable and it performs the way I want it to. So I use this for seven inch Kara. Now, if I'm doing inked comics, and the ink is my final stage, or I'm gonna do digital coloring on top of that. I like to use Strathmore 500 series Bristol. This is vellum Bristol. So vellum Bristol has a soft tooth to it. This would be good for color pencil. Um, I don't have it handy, but it looks very similar to this, except it says plate on it. Plate Bristol is phenomenal for very clean, very smooth inks. This is really good if you want a little bit of dry brush, if you want a little bit of grit, if you want a little bit of feeling. Um, but plate is good for very clean, very smooth inks. And um, either of these surfaces will take um, brush, they'll take brush pin. I recommend, well, they'll also take nib. So this is what I typically use for my larger pages. And if you're interested in seeing that process, I can link my Cicada Summer process for you guys. Those were all black and white brush pin on Bristol paper. Now these, this is a recipe spread from another comic I was working on. These were penciled using pink lines, actually. Pink lines on um, 
Fabriano uh, studio paper. So kind of inexpensive cellulose paper, but I really like the texture of it and I wasn't gonna use it for watercolor. As you guys can see, it is red lead on top of those pink lines. The pink lines are faint enough that I could very easily drop them in Photoshop. Red lead, um, red Pentel brush pin, which is a dye-based brush pin. Um, Sakura Pigma FB, and I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, but it's a very small waterproof brush pin. Pigma FB, and then for the larger areas, Sak uh, Pentel Pigment brush pin, also waterproof. And I also used a little bit of PH Martin's Bleed Proof White to just sort of do some corrections and do some cleaning up. And I did a little bit more of that digitally, but usually when I work traditionally, I try to keep it as close to the as original as possible. That's really important to me. I mean, I have done some pieces that are like definitely split between digital and traditional, but for something like this, I want it to be as traditional as possible. Now I did letter this digitally just because I'm a terrible letterer. And then this was done on Canson Moulin de Roy, which I don't normally use for comics because it's a softer cotton rag paper and it just doesn't always take the ink the way I want it to, especially for fine details. Um, I am really happy with how this piece turned out now. And I have a video of me painting this piece that should be coming up for you guys in the future. But um, it was not painted it, on this mat board. It was painted on stretcher boards. And then I cut it out and I matted this because this was a submission for SCBWY Mint South. But this was painted with Da Vinci watercolors. It was inked with Pigma FB and Pentel pigment brush pens. And uh, yeah, on, on Canson Moulin de Roy. So these are sort of the finishes we might... Oh, and I used uh, Sakura of America graphic three tech pins because they are big calligraphy pins. I use those to do my borders and I really like using waterproof calligraphy pins to do my borders. So we can talk about that in a minute. I do have tutorials on that as well. So once you kind of know what you want your finished product to look like, you can decide what level of finish, what finish materials you're going to use. So we're going to talk about inking next because that's just a more traditional approach to comics than say watercolor. When it comes to inks, to papers, to inking supplies, you really have a world of options. And this can be daunting for a lot of people. I think it's wonderful because it really allows you to mix and match to find exactly the feel you're looking for. So if you have friends who already have a nice art supply collection, um, if you have access to a store that'll kind of let you noodle around with things in store before you commit to owning it, or if you have access to a large art supply community or you know, like if you're part of a school where you can borrow things from friends, um, I really recommend you noodle around, you play around, you figure out what works for you. Barring that, I am a review and resource channel here and I have reviews, I think for almost all of these products on the table and if I haven't reviewed it, I definitely have videos where I've demonstrated it. So if you see something that you're interested in but you're not sure about, you can always send, leave me a comment, you can always send me an email and I'll do my best to help you out. So we're gonna start with the brush. And I have here a Creative Mark Rhapsody Kalinsky Sable brush. It's not the best Kalinsky Sable brush, but it's quite affordable. You can get them down at Jerry's Art Rama. What I like about these is I don't live near Dick, Dick Blick. And when you're buying brushes, you really wanna try and buy them in person, particularly if you're using them for inking. And what you want to find, and this brush has seen so many better days, um, if what you want to find is you want to find a brush that's going to come to a nice sharp tip. And you do that by literally sticking it in your mouth, wetting it down and seeing how sharp the point is. Now the go-to for years was the Winsor & Newton series set. Series 7 Kalinsky Sable Brush. And if you can find a good one, that's great. But there's been a lot of people complaining that they've gone down in quality. So this is one of the reasons you can't just order it from dickblake.com. Um, there are also people who swear by like Rosemary and Co. handmade brushes. But again, there are people who also say the quality has gone down. And for either of those brands, they're both so expensive and you're buying them often sight unseen that I just can't recommend 
you know, I just can't recommend that out of hand. I can't say, yes, they're always going to be good because there's a lot of quality control issues, unfortunately. So if you have... <clears throat> If you have the opportunity to buy your brushes in person, that's great. Princeton also makes a good uh, Kalinsky Sable brush. I got it in my Inktober box in 2016. It's like se Princeton 7050. I can find a link for you guys. That one's also nice. Um, and some people really want to try using synthetics for various reasons. Um, the only synthetic I've ever found that I thought might be a good fit and this is a little bit ridiculous is a low cornell 70 20 ultra round and i think i got this in an arts next as well and i really like using this one for my applying white lead proof white it works really well with thicker inks with gouaches it's got a lot of snap and that's really going to be so kalinsky sable is a natural hair that has a lot of snap and that's why it has a lot of snap and also has what's called a belly me pull this off again. So the belly is the nice kind of rounded part. This is a rather short brush to see that, but the belly is the rounded part that's going to hold all your ink. A synthetic brush doesn't have a belly. It's not going to hold your ink. Your ink's going to fall out of your brush, which is why I'm not a big fan of synthetic brushes for necessarily um, sort of the mid range details. I use synthetics to do my washes and to cover large areas. And then I use synthetics for very small details, but for sort of that medium area of working my watercolors, I don't really like synthetics, but this is the closest I've ever found. And I've tried a lot of different synthetics for a good inking synthetic brush. So we've kind of taken a look at brushes and I'm going to do a demonstration after I go through all of this. Next, we're going to look at the next historical thing. Um, and, you know, we can get really historical. We can talk about reed pins. I have videos of that on this channel. We can talk about sumi brushes. I've talked about those on this channel. You really have a lot of options when it comes to inking. So here we have a couple of dip pins in holders. And this is what manga cut typically use. They use either G nibs or they, or, yeah, G pens, which are... I think of them kind of as like shonen nibs because they deliver a lot of ink. They can do really bouncy, energetic lines. Like think Rumiko Takahashi's work, think G pins. And then we have a, this is a Kurotake spoon nib. These are more like for shoujo, so very delicate lines. Um, you're not going to get a lot of expressive line work with this unless you overwork it. We also have here a caged G nib and that's where someone welded a spring. And these are really cool because they really add to the carrying capacity. So you're dipping into your ink less frequently. You're also going to need a nib holder and you can buy sets of nibs. This is a, that come with nib holders. This is a Tachikawa nib holder. You can get these through paper and ink arts. You can get them through Amazon. I really like these. These are a lot easier on my hands. Um, this is a Kuratake nib holder. It's also nice. And you can see that they both have double rings, plastic double rings. So that is so that they can hold crow quill and other really, really fine nibs, as well as these larger nibs. And if you're looking for the right nib for you, I actually have nib reviews where I kind of went through this collection of nibs and that's why they're all labeled and reviewed them on this channel. And that's not going to be any substitute for you practicing yourself, but it will kind of help you narrow it down by the characteristics you're looking for. And then you can go to Paper and Ink Arts and you can order just one because that what's really cool about Paper and Ink Arts, instead of making you order six or 10 or however many came in the pack, you can order nibs open stock. And there's also different types of nib holders. This is a Karen Dosh one where it kind of slips into a ring and holds it tight. This is a brass folded pen that I was, it was actually a Christmas present and it was given to me by my fiance and he'd ordered it from an artist, like a comic artist who makes these in his garage. So that's really cool. And I have a review of that. We also have here some little tank nibs and I think these are Tachikawa tank nibs. These used to be my favorite. Um, and these have, you see this here, this is the reservoir and it holds a lot of ink and it has, it can deliver both a really nice strong line and a really soft, subtle line. So I don't want to go too much into it in this video because I've gone into it on the blog and I've gone into it in other videos, but there are different types of nibs. You have nibs that are for doing borders like this here. This is an A nib by Speedball. You have calligraphy nibs like this one here. 
This is a C4, also by Speedball. You have lettering nibs, and I don't know if I have any in here, but lettering nibs are used for let, like hand lettering, and they have a soft rounded point, kind of like that uh, rectangular point we just looked at. And I have a video where I talk about that, so I'm just going to link that for you guys who are interested in that. I don't, I don't like hand lettering. I took a class on it. I practice it. My handwriting is terrible. My hand lettering is terrible. I letter digitally, but there's still comic artists who do letter traditionally. And with for that, there's a lot of ways they can do that. You can now print out guides, but before you could print out guides, or before you could print out a guide and then use a light table over it, there was the Ames lettering guide. And I personally don't have any tutorials on how to use this, this delight, but there are tutorials out there. I will link one for you guys in the description below. And basically all it did is you could set it to the size you want, and then you slide it across a ruler. So you've already got to have three hands here and you use a pencil to like mark out your lines. I wanted to show you guys that mostly just so you could understand the pain. And here we have Dinky Dips. These are really cool because they are tiny little containers that you fill yourself with the ink of your choice. And it's a lot easier than dipping it in a bottle of ink. You're, so when you dip a brush or you dip a nib in a bottle of ink, unless it has like kind of a reservoir in it specifically for that, you're gonna over dip. You're gonna get ink all over it. You're gonna get ink all up in the ferrule, which I do anyway. With the Dinky Dips, oh, and then if you have a cat who's awful, looking around for my awful cat, they may knock the ink over, it gets all over the table, it ruins your stuff. With Dinky Dips, they you can get them not in the wooden holder. I really recommend though you get the wooden holder, and this is something else you can get through paper and ink arts. And I should caveat, they are absolutely not a sponsor of this channel, but they are local and they do have a lot of great things. Um, you can get the individual cups, but I recommend you get the wooden holder because the wooden holder is almost, you can bat it off the table, but it's almost impossible to just knock off the table. It also controls how much ink you get on your brush, you get on your nib, and it also controls how much ink goes bad because some inks do go bad. Some India inks go bad, Sumi inks go bad, Walnut inks go bad. So having it in this tiny little container limits the amount of waste. So instead of having a a bottle of Black Star that might harden on you because you leave it open all the time while you're inking, you're just going to have a little dinky dip of Black Star that might harden. So it kind of helps control your waste. Now, for me, I have hand control issues sometimes. I get tremors. Um, so for me, while I do love inking with brushes, and I have examples of inking with brushes, in fact, my whole mermaid thing that's airing right now is me inking with brushes. Um, and I like inking with dip pens as well. I really find for my day-to-day -day inking, inking with Fude and brush pens are the easiest. And calligraphers, brush calligraphers have kind of discovered how amazing these things are. So, you know, and also other comic artists. I've been a real, real evangelical about how amazing brush pens are, Fude pens are, what a lifesaver they are for me. So there's not one. I have a variety here, and these are calligraphy pens that I want to talk about in a moment. I have a variety here. We talked about the Pigma FB. This is made by Soccer of America. They make a set of three, the FB, the MB, the BB. The FB is the smallest tip. And I have a video where I talk about these and how much I love them. These are waterproof, so they're good for watercolor, and they are Copic slash alcohol marker proof. So you can use these to ink your Copic illustrations. I have here a Pintel brush pen. This is a pigment one. They also make dye ones. The pigment ones are really nice. They do tend to clog, but they're really nice in that it's pigment ink, so you can watercolor on top of it, or you can ink wash on top of it. It's not gonna bleed the way the dye-based would, but you might wanna use that bleeding, so that is an option, and that's why it's kinda good to understand your materials and understand their properties, understand what they're made up of, so that you can experiment with them and you can do new things with them. And Pintel also sells the refills of these, and I'm actually waiting on some refills for these. But I really like them. You can get really nice dry brush with them. They leave a nice sort of just ink look on the paper. Um, I find that the dye base ones sometimes look like marker. These definitely look like inks. And they're just really handy to have. I really enjoy them. And they also come in a smaller size, which I don't have yet, but I am 
I do have one coming in the mail because I want to practice using this more. And then on the non-waterproof, non-copic proof side, although so we have, there's a really wide variety of brush pins. This is one by Kuratake. It's fairly small, but it has a nice larger sort of foam rubber nib. You can get some really, really nice bouncy lines. And then we have my standard, the Kuratake Fudego Kochi. Use the heck out of this thing. I often use it when I'm inking comic pages, although I've kind of switched over to the pigment based ones just so that they're less prone to bleeding. And any brush pin like this, it's gonna be great for having more dynamic, more bouncy line art. You can also use, um, Sakura makes a brush pin, Copic makes a brush pin, you can get pit pins with a brush tip. I don't like their brushes as much because these use, um, other than this nylon individual bristled one, these use compressed foam, sort of like Copic markers, so there's a lot of bounce. You can really abuse these. These use compressed fiber, they're prone to fraying, they're prone to blowing out, they're prone to bleeding. They're, they just, they, they get consumed a lot faster. So on that note, we're going to switch over now to technical pens, which I think are the kind of pens a lot of people are familiar with. These are Sakura Microns. I used to swear only by um, Copic Multilanders because I'd use the metal ones that you could refill, but it's getting a lot harder to find those refills. So I'm just kind of slid back into using microns. Microns are cool because you can find them just about anywhere from Walmart to Amazon to Michaels to art stores. You can find them affordably. So these are kind of a good egalitarian inking supply and they come in a variety of sizes from, I don't even have the teeny tiny one here, do I? Yeah, I do. From like 0 0.005, which I don't have, to 0.1 to 0.3. 2.5, 2.8, which is what a lot of people use to letter with, to their graphics, which has a bullet point and then a chisel point. And I love these for borders. And then to three in the graphic. And this one needs to be replaced because as you guys can see, there's a divot taken out of it. And then we can slide into the Pigma Calligrapher. And these are very similar to the graphic. I like to use these for borders. They're built differently, if you guys can tell. And they're also not quite the same size. Like this three is smaller than my other three. Or it seems like it's smaller. Yeah, it's just slightly smaller. It's also narrower. So I end up using both. And I would love it if Sakura would make a five because that would give me a really nice border. And again, I have tutorials here on this channel for how to use these as um, bordering tools. So I promised you guys a demonstration. And I do have other videos where I demonstrate all of these materials, but I wanna do just kind of a really quick demonstration so you can see how the materials perform. So I have here a Canson mixed media sketchbook. These are great for sort of inexpensive mixed media applications. You can do watercolor in it. You can do some inking in it. You can even do comics like daily comics. If you wanted to do daily comics, you can do ink wash in them. They're not the greatest, but they're not the worst. So it's a good, it's in my opinion, that's what a sketchbook should be for, for pl playing with mixed media, for trying out new techniques and not spending a lot of money. All right, time for our quick inking supply showdown. I pulled out my acrylic ruler. We're gonna use the metal edge. I'm gonna demonstrate how you can, you, first of all, you wanna get off of the rings if you're gonna be pulling a straight edge in a sketchbook. That should be obvious, but you know, sometimes we forget things, sometimes we don't think about things. And I'm gonna use the, doo -doo -doo, where are you? The Graphic 3. So what's also cool about, these actually can be really cool for sketching because you can get some neat thick and thin lines. And I used to use calligraphy pins for some of my figure drawing practice. So we're gonna, first of all, we're not gonna line the busted end up against the metal edge, but we're gonna line the regular edge. And see how easy it is just to draw a quick border. And let's say you want something thin. Let's turn it on the other side. And if you're not catching the ruined end, it gives you about a point or a one, 
I guess an 8 point to a 1 point. What am I saying? 0 0.08 millimeter to a 1 millimeter. You can also do that with brush pins, but you're going to want to keep a paper towel or a Kleenex handy, and you're also going to want to have a steady hand. Now, there are people who do their line work with brushes in this world, which is crazy to me because that I'm, I'm just learning how to do it with a brush pen. You want to try to keep your pressure the same unless, you know, you're going for like speed lines. So you'd start off really light and then you could really bust it out. But what's nice about this metal strip is it prevents capillary action from sucking the ink beneath the ruler and bleeding all over the place. I mean, you know, there's still user error, but it kind of reduces the amount of user error. We're going to do that with a solid brush pen. I like this one because it's really, really soft. You can get some really nice woobly lines. I don't like this one because it's not waterproof. So you can get really, really fine lines and then you can get really, really thick lines. And these were originally designed for calligraphy and for signing, like for people to sign their names with in Japan and China. So to me, they're great cartoonist brushes because it allows you to do a variety of line weights. And then the Fude Gokochi, which is a little bit stiffer, has a much smaller nib. You can also kind of see, okay, so when this whole thing gets filled up with black, or you can start seeing the ink, it's basically dead. Don't fly with these. Not because they'll explode, but because it basically wastes your Fude pen. And then we have the Pigma FB, which this one's all beaten up, all chewed up. I've been using it for a really long time because I love them. But you can get thin lines and these are, this is what I mean. And I'm zooming because I know you guys can't see that. That's what I mean by dry brushing. And I'll do it with the pigment brush as well. It's when you start seeing the speckles of the paper. So if you don't want a dry brush effect at all, you would use something very smooth like plate. If you want a lot of dry brush, if you want a lot of texture, cause it can look really good for like wood textures, for fur textures, um, just to give a more organic feel to your art, um, a more retro feel maybe, then you would use something with vellum or something labeled smooth or even a watercolor paper or even a pastel paper. Okay, so we kind of touched on the brush pins. I want to talk just a smidge about microns. I know everyone knows about these, but I see a lot of younger artists. They, let's say they want a thicker line weight. So they'll just rework the area like 18 times. And yeah, you can do that. And if you're working with like, let's say you're working with one of the Copic lavenders, which don't come in brush pins, then, you know, you're going to kind of have to do that. But that's why I tell you guys to try brush print pins and Fude pins because it takes so much longer to ink like this and it's actually kind of frustrating to ink like that. So these are actually really good for lettering. They're also really good for um, doing kind of like buildings, house interiors, things where you need kind of a straight dead line weight. And some people actually have styles that look really good where it's just kind of a straight one line weight sort of thing. So if that's your art style, you know, that would be a use for that. And don't switch over to Fude pins because that's not going to solve that problem. Next, we're going to take a quick look at our brush. I'm going to do a separate video on brush care for you guys because I think it's a really important topic, but it's not a topic I really want to dive into today. I do think I have like um, an October prep or maybe even my... Uh, 30, my uh, mermaid prep where I talk about how to do that. Now I'm not going to use these dinky dips because they all have acrylic ink in them. And not that acrylic ink is really that different from other inks other than you want to like get it out of your brush ASAP. Oop, comes with a little dropper. This is black star. Um, I think it's like a high carb ink. And I also have a video where I have multiple videos where I demonstrate different brush sizes with inking. So depending on how big you work and how tiny your tiniest details are, 
it's kind of going to depend on what brush size you grab. This is a size three, which is a little bit, it used to be a little bit large for me, but I've been working on becoming more comfortable with these larger sizes and with heavier line weights. And this is something that kind of takes some practice. So, you know, if your first shot isn't very good, that's okay. And I think high carb is waterproof. I'm pretty sure high carb is waterproof. Yeah, waterproof India ink after it has dried. And then we're going to slide on over. And I'm just gonna demonstrate the spoon in the Genib for you guys today. Since I've already, I have videos again of me messing around with all the other different ones. And this is, I don't know, oh, it's not on camera, okay. This is why, you're about to see why I recommend Dinky Dips over, see, and it gets all over, see, ah. That's my fault, I chose that, but it's good for demonstration purposes. So this is a genib, thin, 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 thick. And then it does this, which is called railroading. And you know, maybe you wanna use that for your art style. Could use that for speed lines. But if you have the cage on your genib, it's gonna be less of an issue because it's gonna hold a lot more ink. And nibs take a lot longer to dry than brush because you're basically putting down a deposit of ink rather than painting the surface. And I will clean this off off camera. That is not a good clean job. Do not, uh, you guys can't see it. Rest assured, I did not properly clean it. I'm gonna do the same now with the spoon nib, which is also called a kabocha nib. So thin, 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 delicate. You can put a little bit of pressure on it and get slightly thicker lines, but it's never gonna be, unless you're ruining your nib, it's never gonna be as thick as the G-nib line. And then for why not, I'm gonna grab a tank nib. Now, my tanks are kind of finicky. Will you fit? Yes, you will. Sometimes they won't fit on that inner ring. And I had found that dipping them in water first and then kind of shaking the water out helped, but I still have, ugh getting ink all over. I still kind of had issues with tank nibs. So tanks are like croquil nibs, so very, very fine, but they can hold a lot more ink. Blech. Just making a mess. Anyway, I think I have covered all of our inking supplies here. So I hope this was kind of a good introduction for you guys on just the basics of comic making art supplies. And I do have videos, explanations, reviews, and tutorials for pretty much everything I've talked about today. So if it's not in the cards, check the description below. It will be there. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any questions or if you wanna see something demonstrated more in depth, let me know in the comments below or you can go ahead and shoot me an email. I highly recommend you head on over to natosoup.blogspot.com and check out my wonderful intro to comics, intro to comic craft series over there. I have a lot of written tutorials about writing, about scripting, about brainstorming, about plotting, about development, all the sort of stuff that doesn't necessarily make for a great video. I have it over there in blog post form for you guys to check out. And I hope I will see you guys again really soon. Again, let me know if you've got any questions. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have a great day. Bye guys.